Over the years, people have traveled to Calvin University and Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan to worship and learn. This year, we travel virtually around the world to many different worshiping communities. We are living in a time of fear, upheaval, and so much death. Each community has been shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic in different ways. However, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cling to this promise, which will guide us for this online experience. Hi, my name is Julie Tai, and I'm the director of chapel at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Before we begin, I want to give you a little glimpse into who we are as a community. We are a multi-denominational, multilingual, multi-ethnic, global seminary. Those characteristics you'll find in the service that we've provided for you today will be going in and out of Korean, Spanish, English, and American Sign Language throughout the service. And we're in the midst of a pandemic. In fact, we're in lockdown right now as I'm recording this. And so much of what you'll see is the inside of our own homes. And sometimes it's the little patch of grass right outside our doors. And other times when it was safe to do so, we were able to record on our campus. All those things you'll find in our service today. However you come to this service today, I pray that God will bless you on your journey. And even though we're separated by screens, I do pray that the spirit would bind us together in mighty and beautiful and profound ways. Let's worship God together. Now we are going to learn some sign together. Hopefully you feel good about that. So um, we're going to learn Holy Spirit dwell in us. So Holy Spirit and then dwell within us. So let's try Holy together. Holy, kind of make an H with your hand. Holy Spirit dwell within us. You're my 
words from Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. is good to those who wait for him to the soul that seeks him it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the lord your mercies are new new every sunrise your faithfulness wakens wakens the day your mercies are God who makes the sun rise, we open our eyes to new mercies, to an invitation to carry out our day with gratitude and grace. We rise with the sun, with a renewed sense of our flesh in harmony with the spirit. Let us respond together.
Let's pray. 주님은 고난을 당하셨고 지금도 그 고난 가운데 계시며 그러나 주님은 모든 고통을 끝나게 하실 것입니다. 우리는 오늘 하루의 삶 가운데서 세상에 넘쳐나는 혼란과 고통의 소리를 접하게 됩니다. 조화에서 분열로 치닫는 것처럼 우리의 육체는 성령님과 씨름하고 있습니다. 
Espíritu que nos escudriña, en la noche somos confrontados con todo lo que ha ocurrido en nuestro día. Con ternura, llámanos a reflexionar, a confesar y arrepentirnos de las formas en la cual hemos vivido según la carne, resistiendo tu llamado. Spirit who searches us. In the night, we are confronted with all that occurred in our day. Gently, call us to reflect, confess, and repent of the ways we lived according to the flesh, resisting your call. Let us respond together. Today's scripture comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 13. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, 
The Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let us respond together. You will live. That's Paul's affirmation of a great hope that's ours in Christ. Because there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ, and because of the gift of the Spirit that has taken up residence in our lives, we can be confident of this. We will live. If the Spirit is in us, life is in us. And if the Spirit is not in us, then we do not have life. Paul's aware that it's this great hope of the Spirit's presence that gives us an assurance that life has the final word and not death. It will be as faithful as God's own promises and actions in Christ by the Holy Spirit that we can walk in the confidence of being alive. This great hope that Paul's affirming is one which is so profound and shapes so much about his understanding of the journey that we're on right now. Oh, he'll go on to make it clear that we live in a world where there's still plenty of groaning. There's lots of things that don't always signal life but death. And yet he wants us to walk in the confidence that we are alive and will be alive. He is aware that there is this tension because we still live in the flesh. That is, we are still people who are not fulfilling everything that we will one day be because we are still existing inside our mortal bodies, as he says. And yet flesh is not so much about our physical existence, really. It's much more about our moral existence, our spiritual existence, our awareness that we are more bent in on ourselves than bent in toward God, that we're more interested in the way that we think about the world than the way that God thinks or wants us to respond to the world or to God himself. See, it's this that Paul wants us to overcome, to display a vivid reality that we are alive, free from the death of the flesh, and set free to live in the Spirit. Now, often when we talk about this text, I think our minds, particularly in some circles, tend to go toward the change of an inner life. Surely that's part of it. But I think for today, I'd like us to focus in a different direction. What are the public evidences that we are actually alive by the Spirit in Christ? What is it that bears witness to the fact that we have let our fleshliness go and that we are leaning into and finding life in the Spirit? So often, when we think only of our own interior life, we can even find it a cul-de-sac where we never get outside that small space. It's important that we think about that, but let's move beyond it today as we reflect a bit about the social or public implications of being alive in the spirit. There's many different ways that we could illustrate that. I want to just choose a few. For example, often just in interpersonal relationships, we struggle with attitudes, attitudes that have been part of what we've been shaped by as a child growing up, the family that we've been a part of, the culture that we've been in, the circumstances that we've faced. All of these things can be evidences of a need to overcome those habits and practices which often make relationships harder, that are not the seedbed of hope and of life, 
but are small little petty preoccupations that are part of the way that we've been living and part of the environment that has shaped us. If we're going to be alive in the spirit, then we need to take those things seriously and find ways that by the spirit and power of God, we can move beyond our own petty preoccupations. We're called to a new life in Christ. Let's let go of the flesh of our own resistance to actually becoming the kind of loving people that God has created us to be. Let's think about it in a couple of other ways. For example, one of the features of growing up in the United States is the experience of being shaped by American individualism. It's notorious around the world that individualism is one of Americans' most characteristic hallmarks. And yet, while there's a place, of course, for affirming the value and dignity of each person, and that that's both biblically sustained, it's theologically important, it's part of realizing that each of us have been knit together in our mother's womb, that we are to be given honor and dignity. That in the United States, that is put on steroids. And it begins, it begins to show itself in ways that are, are really far beyond simply honor and dignity. It can easily move into a kind of ideology where the priority of self trumps almost anything else. The priority of being able to have life in the way that we want it to be is the primary goal. And anything that might tyrannize that or challenge it or undo it or stop it, well, the culture of individualism says, no, I, I alone should be able to control my life and have the destiny that I decide upon. Now, that ideology, frankly, can move to an even more extreme, which is almost an idolatry, the idolatry of self. The world is about me, me, me in every given direction that I might look in. It's a story of our own self-preoccupation. It's an inability to move beyond ourselves or to let anyone or anything even be a rival. Brothers and sisters in Christ, those of us who are North Americans carry the potential not just of an ideology, but of an idolatry. It is a sign of life in the flesh. It is not a sign of life in the spirit. We have to face that reality. We have to speak the power and mercy of God to forgive us, to change us, to release us from the idolatry of ourselves in order to actually see our neighbor, see our friends and even our enemies in ways that are no longer put simply through the lens of my own self-interest. That is American individualism. And it's a sign, as much as not, of a life committed to the flesh more than simply a life honoring and reflecting the dignity of being made in God's image. That is a crisis for the church. It makes it impossible for the church often to get beyond itself. And yet the whole purpose of the gospel is to be given life beyond our own selves. May God help us to find life in the spirit by putting to death a kind of individualism that can subvert our relationships, that can blind us to the importance and value of our neighbor, giving ourselves first place rather than God and letting that allow us to see and perceive and engage our neighbors, our friends, and even our enemies in a different way. I think of people who have been exemplars of this to me for example, I have a friend who grew up in the Muslim world. His family was Christian, but the surrounding people in their neighborhood were Muslim. And in that context, there were great relationships, wonderful relationships. And yet over time, a change of politics, a change of social reality, often subverted that set of initially very positive friendships and things became a lot rougher, a lot harder, a lot more grueling, a lot more persecuted. And this friend ended up being not only persecuted in an ordinary daily sense by just the way that he was harassed, but ultimately he was put in jail because of his Christian faith. By the grace of God, he had died enough to himself to be able to see and love his Muslim brothers and sisters despite all of this. Eventually he came to the United States to study at Fuller Seminary and that's where I had met him. Now it was at about the same time that our highly esteemed former president, Dr. Richard Mao, had hosted a group of Muslim scholars on campus in Pasadena. And he had welcomed them and he had turned over his outer offices for them to pray in five times a day. When I heard this story, I thought how great it was that this had happened. But I'll admit that voyeuristically, I was a bit curious about what certain people in the Fuller community 
what certain donors might wonder about this. I happened to run into this friend that I was just telling you about who'd grown up in the Muslim world. And I said, you know, did you know that this had happened? He said, no. I said, well, furthermore, did you know that he had been given opportunity for the visiting scholars to pray in his outer offices? What do you think about that? And he, without pausing, said, well, it's not a big deal to give them an office. We're supposed to give them our lives. Right, I thought, that's exactly what I'm thinking. That's, that's just exactly what I was thinking. It's about giving them our lives or not. See, it has to do with what it is that we're prepared to be or to say or how we're willing to act to really love in a new way. Not putting ourselves in the center, not putting our tribe in the center, but putting God in the center, a God of love, to Muslims and to Christians alike. Or I think of another friend who was really the victim of brutal hatred and violence against him in the nation of Africa where he is from and where he lives. He was considered by the president of the country one of its greatest enemies. And when it looked as though he was about to be killed by the state, my friend fled temporarily. After a period of time, he came back. And the first place that he went to was not the safety of his home. He didn't come in under dark of night. He didn't slink in. He came in on a plane. He drove straight to the house of the person who really was the number one public enemy of the state, who was being held under house arrest. He had come to pray with his Christian brother who was being held in this way. And when the police said he couldn't go in and worship or pray with his friend, my friend said, well then, how about if I lead you in worship? Let's pray together. Now, this bold act was not to me an instinctive one. Knowing his life was truly under threat, I'm not sure the first place I would go is maybe one of the most spotlighted places of government interest. And to go there as a Christian, to pray with the person that the state had decided was the enemy, and then being resistant in doing that, to say to those who represented the enemy of the state, he said, let's pray. How can you live that way? Because he's full of the spirit, because he's living life in the spirit. He's free from the places where his life could have been bound in a smallness, in an inattention, in a self-protection that that's, could have easily determined the outcome of that story. I'm grateful my friend's alive. I'm grateful the man who was held hostage was alive. And I'm also grateful that in a country of great need, there are people so alive in the spirit. The same thing is true, of course, in the United States. There are, are people here who are great evidences of this, communities of faith, congregations that in this time of life and death during COVID are showing all kinds of signs of the reality of being alive in the spirit. I think of one friend who was a student when I first met her here at Fuller. She was a person who had been from the Midwest. She had come to study and do an MDiv at Fuller. She'd also studied and worked hard as an employee at Fuller. And she had taken up some very, very significant roles of leadership. She was young, she was passionate, she was committed, she was bright, she was dedicated, she was African-American and she suffered. She suffered even in a theological seminary that represents this gospel of life. She brought issues to everyone's attention. She shared in doing so with other students and other staff. She told the story, she represented the story, she argued for change, and she did so faithfully, resiliently, but ultimately, after several years, it was just a burnout. She left. She'd finished her degrees, she resigned from her position, and she went to just heal. She did that. She gave herself to all the things that she needed to do in order to be made well. And then, all of a sudden, one day in a southern state, she ended up watching, as we all did, the murder of George Floyd. A murder that took place in a man who lived in her hometown not far from her own family home. And she immediately went there. She went there to serve, to care, 
to love, to safeguard, to tend. She's become the curator of the collection of memories and of witnesses and of honoring that's been brought together all around the site where George Floyd was killed. How can she do this? How can she lean daily into such an ongoing painful story, unresolved in a nation that still has a history of racism? She can do it because she's alive in the spirit. She can do it because Jesus Christ calls her to be evidence of new life. See, racism is its own vestige of fleshliness. White superiority and supremacy is a sign of fleshliness. It's not a sign of life in the spirit. The kind of ways in which the white church in America has often been so intertwined with a long and protracted multi-century history of racism is a sign that the church in this context is unwilling or unable or both to actually lay down this kind of fleshly perspective and attitude and actions and institutional structures and to remake ourselves in order to show that we are alive in Christ, not just alive by being white or male, not just alive because of our economic or educational privilege. No, we are alive not because of those things, but because of Jesus Christ, whose spirit gives us life. Paul says at the end of the text, you will live. He's confident of it. I want to be confident in claiming it for all of us who are watching this service as well. We will live, but we have to choose to live. Will we give up the death, the death that can so easily cling to us, that it destroys and upsets and distorts still the reality of this new life that we're meant to display? Or will we allow it to die, in fact, put it to death, in order that we might live and that others might come to life as well? confess our sins. Loving God, you have set before us the bounty and beauty of your creation, the richness and diversity of humankind. At the same time, you have set before us a choice between a life abundant and a diminished life leading to death. Forgive us, O God, for we have too often selfishly consumed your creation tainted and polluted its beauty, and prioritize human beings and their cultures in ways that privilege ourselves and disadvantage others. Forgive us when we quench your spirit and dim the light of your love and life in our lives. Forgive us our rescue, our health, and our salvation. We do not live the lives we ought we serve ourselves and not you. Our world is deeply torn by all the tensions and outright conflicts that come from worshiping less than you. We confess our wrongs, 
our misdirected values, our misguided purposes, and the death it brings to your creation. Correct us, direct us, and guide us in the ways of your redeeming love and life-giving spirit. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Purge us of death and renew a right and living spirit within us.
sisters and brothers in Christ. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ gave his life that we might live. We who have been baptized in Christ have died to sin and death and risen in Christ, reborn of water and spirit. And though we may be slow to confess our sins, our Lord is quick to forgive. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. At the time of this recording, our friend Michael Stafford, who is a member of this team, was supposed to lead this next song. However, Michael suffered a stroke and is currently not awake yet. We wrestled with whether or not we should do this song at all. But the more we prayed, the lyrics get back up again seem to resonate more and more. So we dedicate this next song to you, Michael. We pray and we believe you will get back up again. People of God, will you join us in this prayer and sing this next song with us?
Your mercies are new, new every sunrise. Your faithfulness wakens, wakens the day. Your mercies are new, new every sunrise. Your faithfulness wakens, wakens the day. Let us pray. Eternal God, Son, and Spirit, the Holy Trinity breathes life into our dead bones and we are made alive again. We awaken to new mercies once more and you offer another opportunity for us to live as eternal people, loving our eternal neighbors. We give thanks and rejoice. Let us respond together. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready to her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints we sing together
Now to God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, beyond all we could ask or even imagine according to the power that is at work within us, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen.